Tim Gurner is a uh, big Australian real estate developer. Uh, he was at a conference recently talking about uh, the power relationship between employer and employee. And um, he said this about the current environment. I think the problem that we've had is that we've, you know, we, we have people decided they didn't really want to work so much anymore through COVID and that has had a massive issue on productivity. You know, tradies have definitely pulled back on productivity. You know, they, they have been paid, paid a lot to do not too much in the last few years. And we need to see that change. We need to see unemployment rise. Unemployment has to jump 40, 50% in my view. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. I mean, there is a, there's been a systematic change where employees feel the employer is extremely lucky to have them um, as opposed to the other way around. So it's a dynamic that has to change. We've got to kill that attitude and that has to come through hurting the economy, which is what the whole global, you know, the, the world is trying to do. The governments around the world are trying to increase unemployment to get that to some sort of normality. And we're seeing it. I think every employer now is seeing it. I mean, there is definitely massive layoffs going off. People might not be talking about it, but people are definitely laying people off and we're starting to see less arrogance in the employment market. And that has to continue because that will cascade across the cost balance. Well, uh, Gurner uh, later apologized for those comments as being, um, you know, a bit intemperate or harsh. But, I mean, he, he's not wrong that that's what Jay Powell has effectively been attempting to do for much of the last year. Uh, ironically, it appears that what Sean Fain, the president of the United Auto Workers, is trying to do as well, although you would never say it. Uh, for more on this, we're pleased to be joined by Chris Whalen. He's an investment banker and chairman of Whalen Global Advisors, author of Ford Ben from Inspiration Enterprise and editor for the Institutional Risk Analyst. Chris, thanks for joining us. Um, Mr. Gurner could have perhaps been more artful with his rhetoric, but um, he's not wrong in terms of what he's observing, policymakers, certainly central bankers doing. No, no, not at all. He's through right on target. You know, if you think of the amount of money that was thrown at U.S. consumers during COVID, both uh, from the Fed and also the fiscal spend from Washington, uh, it's not surprising that people's attitudes change. But he's right. The way you tighten this up is by reminding people that they need to work for a living. So, well, but, uh, you know, the... but we're, we're not quite there yet. We're going to have that conversation soon. Yeah, but no, right. We're not. We're clearly not there because you know you continue to hear uh, it's uh, nothing but good news. Yeah, I mean the price at the pump is a little unnerving, but underlying inflation is uh, cooling down, and uh, we're, we're we're projecting to grow at five percent this quarter. I mean, it's uh, you got a economy. Wages are increasing. I mean, hell, the uh, UAW workers want to make three hundred grand and 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 uh, bring back uh, the defined benefit pensions they scrapped uh, two decades ago. So. I mean, it's happy days are here again. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a shame. You know, we we live in the age of manias of various types, social manias, economic manias, the electric vehicles, for example. Every time I see Toyota make another announcement about their non-lithium batteries, I just laugh <laughs> because all of that investment in lithium battery technology of the past decade that was driven by the woke folk and the progressives is going to be put in the trash can. It's ancient technology. There's no future for lithium. And yet, you know, we still have big companies dumping billions and billions, including Tesla, by the way, uh, into this technology because of the political uh, impetus. That's it. I mean, it, no, no engineer would tell you to do that. It's so, just not a good way to invest your money. <laughs> so what you say the lithium battery is going to go in the garbage. What's the future then? You're going to All have bearings. storage mediums that are Some not bearings. using uh, that sort of chemical, which is what lithium is, uh -huh. uh, to act as the anode. Uh, it, it, it's another way of storing energy, simply. Okay, uh, Lithium batteries are ancient technology. In, in fact, most batteries are ancient technology. Henry Ford wanted to make an electric car, but he realized, thanks to his friend Thomas Edison, that it was not practical. Hmm. Even today, when you say to people, look, get a hybrid, don't get a pure EV, because they, they think, oh, I have to get an electric vehicle, right? To be politically correct. It's not practical. It's a problem.
problem. What do you do if you're with your family and you can't charge the car? <laughs> you know, you wait. <laughs> or you're in the winter in Illinois and the battery doesn't charge as well in cold temperatures. Thank well, you. Well, maybe maybe Henry Ford should have been hanging out with Nikola Tesla rather than Thomas Edison. And we wouldn't have no, Elon it, Musk. No, it, it was just the technology of the time. Yeah, we, we've miniaturized motors now. Batteries are better made than they were 100 years ago, obviously. Um, but everybody saw the promise of electricity. That's always been there. We, so, just, we still don't have the tech yet. But God Almighty, GM could go bust because of this. Look at the money they're losing. Well, what about uh, what about what about because of the, what they are probably going to end up paying out in this UAW contract? I mean, this this has to be uh, great news for right to work states in the South and Southwest, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I I, I think the UAW believes, and this goes back to the comment we started with, right, that they have more leverage than they really do. Because if you force GM into another restructuring, and I think that's going to happen, by the way, uh, these workers are going to get wiped out. They're going to lose their pension. So they should think about that. You know, the automakers have always given their workers too much in terms of pensions and benefits and not enough in the view of the workers, right, in terms of wages. But the automakers can't afford either. You know, they bought labor peace for 50 years in Detroit by giving UAW uh, benefits that later on we saw they couldn't afford, and they took that. Remember? So, uh, so we've seen this movie before. I remember. I used to live in Detroit. So when Sean yep. Fain says, I'm quoting him: "Most of these workers in those companies are scraping to get by, so that greedy CEOs and greedy people like Elon Musk can build more rocket ships and uh, shoot herself." Talking about Gina Barra, obviously, shoot mm. herself into outer space. Is that, is that what's happening, what Sean Fain says? No, no, not at all. You know what GM ought to do? GM ought to just say, fine, we're going to liquidate the company. Yep. We're going to shut down. Thank you so much. Go find another job. All right? Go work for Toyota. See if they put up with this. Well, um, in an EV world, they're going to have to lay off thousands anyway, so they should just take what they yeah. can get now, I think. Yeah, you know, if you haven't segued out of that industry by now, uh, Amy, I think that's a very good question for these people. Why are you still working for GM? You know, are they going to be a winner when the auto industry consolidates down to three or four major manufacturers globally, and you have one company making drivetrains, one company making engines? We're almost there. Right, but you yeah. know, of course, people live in the moment, and in the moment, according to the SEC, the median worker at Tesla makes uh, 34 grand in total comp compared to 80 at Ford um, and they are yeah, yeah 80 at GM and 75 at Ford and uh, they want to bump that up to uh, 300 to hear Bill Farley tell you that's a big bump well, no. the company Pretty won't survive you know GM has been restructured what four times five times since its inception uh, somehow Ford has avoided this it's the grace of God of course um, but, you know, none of these businesses are particularly profitable. It, the only thing I could think of would be better is if we just go into the government grocery business in Chicago. How about that? Hell well, yeah. yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's, we need him to give us a title, the grocery yeah, store. Yeah, we've got, we've got that figured out. We've got the city-owned grocery chain that's coming. Now we're working on city-owned restaurants uh, with the, uh, sub, the guaranteed sub-minimum wage that's, that's being turned into a guaranteed minimum wage for tipped workers mm-hmm. over the next five years. So we want to do... You know, a, a Brandon Johnson city operated restaurant group. Again, not bottom line sensitive, but just for the entertainment of watching them try and run a business. I'm telling you, these are single digit uh, net margin businesses. And if you make a single mistake, you go out of business. That's it. Welcome to the restaurant or an end food business, too, by the way. Are we going to have shoplifting in these city owned grocery stores? Is that well, going to continue? Of course. Of course. Uh, yes, so the then you're done. Forget it. You open the doors. <laughs> the uh, the shoplifting will continue until morale improves. Um, mm-hmm. um, so uh, AI, AI. Uh, we were having this conversation. I don't know if you caught uh, Bill Gurley's talk on that All In podcast the other day about agency capture, regulatory capture. It was a great one on one on this, and he gave some really nice concrete examples. And um, and he's fast forwarding to the present because 
the past examples of regulatory capture that have benefited the behemoths in a particular sector at the expense of competition and thus the consumer, it's happening again, he would argue, I think, in most of Silicon Valley as well, with AI, as uh, people like Sam Altman are, are, are begging to be regulated, meaning protected. And, I, and, and there's a good piece actually by Andy Kessler in the Wall Street Journal about Schumer wanting his cut of the AI oh, cash. Yeah. And so, so what, what, you know, what, what should we understand he about- He usually gets two slices, remember. Right, but, and so, yeah, so what, should we, but what should we understand about AI amid um, Republicans and Democrats saying we gotta slow the pace, Elon Musk and others saying we need to set uh, you know, uh, parameters and guardrails up here? Or should we just say, no, let, let this be as free enterprise, let, let, I mean, not as free enterprise as possible, let, this, let free enterprise dictate the pace and the outcomes and just everybody stay out of it, which you didn't do in so many of these other sectors, much to our detriment. Uh, the only thing I would say is that if AI creates a piece of content, it should be labeled. I saw a piece about a public company yesterday that was written by a chat bot had a extremely attractive photograph going along with it that had nothing to do with the story of course mm -hmm. and you know humans are easily fooled the reason we have regulatory structures is because it's so easy to fool human beings especially when it comes to money what about when the what about when the regulatory structures fool the human beings well no they're captured Right. You know, if, That's the point. If we allow our regulators to work for the industries that they regulate, then we shouldn't complain about the corruption and the duplicity, right? You have to prohibit the regulators from working for the industry that they regulate. Lifetime, by the way. And if you do that, then there's no way for the regulated entities to be nice to the regulator. It, you know, go back to my dad's book on Joe Kennedy and read the first couple chapters about the FEC. In the old days, they put people in jail. They weren't looking to get a job from them. Uh, so it's just a matter of attitude. It's a matter of whether society takes itself seriously. Humans are, if you put a shiny object on they're going to follow it. Chris, so, so you, 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 out you, you, you cut out there for a second. It's a matter of uh, if society takes itself seriously, and then what did you say after that? Well, and wants to have basic rules that govern civil society. You know, you, if you just have a free-for-all, the libertarian uh, open model, right, then you're going to have crime and fraud and violence and everything else. It'll be Darwinian competition. We don't want to live that way. So the question is, do we have a compromise somewhere in between or not? Because obviously we're headed to the other extreme now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. So so other than other than sort of truth and labeling, uh, is that the yeah. only is that the only sort of stricture you would impose on the development of AI? Yeah, I think so because you know the interactions I've had with the technology, like if you call, you know, somebody who pretends to do business with you and they want you to talk to a computer rather than a human being. At a certain point, you put the phone down; it doesn't work. And I think organizations are coming to realize that no matter how much money they put into AI, it's still very brittle it often gets things wrong. And so your customer experience goes to hell. And that is a big problem for companies. So they play with these toys for a while. They throw them on online for customer service and that kind of thing. But if it gets to the point where you actually need an answer, you have to talk to your human being. That's just the way it works. I mean, I, I deal with banks. Banks use this technology extensively and they still haven't figured out a way to get it right. So. What's your latest and greatest handle on the state of our urban centers, particularly as the migrant situation continues to uh, put pressure on sanctuary, uh, desi it's a sanctuary designated uh, communities like Chicago, New York, L.A., and the like? Oh, go into New York City, go into midtown Manhattan, and go buy the hotels that they're using to store illegal immigrants. Uh, they are a wasteland oh, that goes awful. several blocks around the building, um, right next to Grand Central Station. So you have all these firms that are building brand new high-end office space right next to Grand Central. And then you have this ratty old hotel next door with a bunch of lunatics from God knows where, smoking dope and 
shooting one another and everything else because they have nowhere to go. These people have been dropped into a strange city. They have very little support. The you know, you know Mayor Adams has no resources to deal with this, and so it's becoming a public eyesore. But no one cares. Well, so they we, weren't dropped people, in. They they voluntarily got on a bus to take them to New York because they had choices okay, at the border. But, yeah. I'm just letting you know. Yeah, right. We saw so, we saw that clip yesterday. Saw, yeah. uh, can I go to Chicago now? Sure, you can. Yeah, go You're ahead. welcome to America. Do what you want. I mean, they're literally the yeah. border is literally open in portions of Arizona where people just are walking yep. across. And there's like yep. 1,200 a day coming to El Paso alone. And their streets well, are clogged. This is, the, this is the progressive uh, model, guys. We need to find a conservative who can call this what it is, okay? Um, we have totally, totally uh, abdicated any responsibility for our fellow citizens if you embrace the progressive agenda. You're just going to have chaos. I, I don't, you know, to me, I, I wonder sometimes, these are not stupid people, but you wonder, do they care at all? Is it just like the folks up in Albany who are watching our real estate market go to hell? You know, I'll give you an interesting uh, example. FDIC is selling a bunch of rent-stabilized buildings that were owned by Signature Bank, our Signature Bank, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are going to have to retain the majority position because the state legislature has made these buildings unfinanceable. You can't even get a mortgage from a bank because they call them toxic waste. All right. That's what the FDIC calls these buildings. So thank you very much, Albany. That was a really good move. If they don't reverse that 2019 rent control legislation soon, New York is going to be in a really bad situation. You're going to have major buildings in default and nobody's going to want them. So is, is that the next to take them over? Is yeah. that the next shoe to drop? Take them over. Is that the next shoe to drop what we're seeing like Westfield Mall and San Francisco and what you're describing in New York, is that the next shoe to drop when that starts to metastasize further? Yeah, because if you if you have a building that a bank no longer wants to fund, then they they can't walk away because they're going to end up owning the building, right? So imagine the lender then abandons the building. They give the keys to the city and say, here, this is yours. The city will sue the lender and try and force them to take care of it or at least put chain link around it to uh, you know prevent people from going in there and living uh it's going to look like a bad city in latin america is what it's going to look like it's going to look like buenos aires uh you should go down there and have a look so you know that's where we're headed chris whalen is an investment banker chairman uh chairman of uh, whalen global advisors author of ford men from inspiration to enterprise editor of the institutional risk analyst as well chris thanks as always guys have a great day Thanks, you too. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Your show keeps me alive during the week. There's nobody I'd rather listen to between 5 and 9 in the morning than you guys. On AM 560, The Answer. Attention! Road Knights is expanding the army. If you possess the heart of a warrior, the spirit of an adventurer, and an unrelenting drive to conquer new horizons with 3,000 miles weekly under your wheels, then hurry to call. Join the team that is strong as steel and united as convoy, and be on the road towards the glory. Have you had your commercial driver's license for over two years? Are you looking for an over-the-road driving job for the smoothest running, most established trucking company in the Midwest? This is not just a driving job. This is a mission. Visit online at roadnights.us or call 773-2000.